Boom. All right, it's starting. All right, so there it goes. So welcome to Journal Chemistry. This is just an overview of the stuff that we talked about already. You are going to reminder, you know, the mastering site. I do have links in Canvas. Um, I do have worksheets on there. We are not going to be doing them in class per se, but you are welcome to bring them and ask questions from them. And we have a bunch of resources available to you guys. Um, we have the Resource Center, which I briefly mentioned here. Um, for those of you guys that didn't use it in the past, we basically have tutors that are hanging out over in the Resource Center that are bored waiting for you guys to come in and uh, you'll get help. Uh, we, I believe we have three tutors. I'm not sure it'll depend. Do you know how many tutors we have? Um, the chance. Okay, yeah, so yeah, each campus has their own resource center, so in the case where you have, if you have classes at Charleston, you can't make it to this one, you can always drop in over there. We're all teaching the same thing, so you're more than welcome to, uh, to get help that way. Uh, another resource which I see students always overlook is your lab instructor can help you also. So even if your lab instructor is not a lecture instructor, they took chemistry at some point, I, sh I should hope, that they're teaching <laughs> lab for us. <laughs> And yeah, honestly, any of our lab, I know all of our lab instructors are all really good. They can all help you out with the lecture content also. So if you have like some dead time in lab and you're like, hey, I'm having a hard time with the stoichiometry thing, can you help me out? They can probably help you out. You also have each other too, right? So you guys can all work in groups together. I highly, highly recommend that uh, to, get to meet your classmates and make friends. All right, so chapter one, like I said, we're going to go quickly through this stuff. The scientific method is basically a systematic approach to uh, doing research. And there are three main uh, tenets for the scientific method. It's what? Observation, hypothesis, and experimentation, right? So uh, the scientific method, as well as science in general, is a cyclic and iterative process, meaning that uh, we have observations, we have a hypothesis, and then it kind of just go, it keeps going in a cycle. We try to prove or disprove the hypothesis. Uh, does anybody remember the, the key feature that a hypothesis, hypothesis must have in it? What was that? It must be falsifiable, meaning that it's a statement that you can actually prove false. So, for example, if I say the sky is blue, that is not a hypothesis. Saying it, the sky is blue due to Rayleigh scattering, that is a hypothesis that you can prove or disprove then. All right, and uh, observations. There are uh, the main types of uh, observations are either qualitative or quantitative. Uh, qualitative <clears throat> is basically things like color, things they're basically, they're basically things that you're not measuring directly. Where quantitative, uh, they do contain numbers. So saying something like this, the Nevada is hot and dry, you're not associating any, any quantities with that, so we say it's qualitative. Where uh, it's hot outside, it's 100 degrees outside, that's more quantitative. And you'll be making uh, both kinds of observations in lab this semester, depending on what you're doing, which, which lab you're doing. All right, uh, like I said, quantitative, these ones involve numbers. This is where your sig figs come into play, right? <laughs> um, I wanted to mention here that make sure that you guys remember your sig fig rules because you're gonna be Nazi about it in lab. So uh, we're, at, we're actually specifically told by the lab coordinator to be like a Nazi with sig figs for you guys in chemistry 121. Um, when you guys take me, if you take me next semester in lab for 122, I end up being a little bit more strict about it, about sig figs. But anyway, that's what quantitative measurements are. That's where your sig figs matter. All right, scientific method, more uh, recognition of patterns and observations help us form a hypothesis. Another thing too, uh, I've, I, in my opinion, the best hypotheses come from people who looked at work done in the past. You don't want to be reinventing the wheel, right? So that's, that's technically not part of the scientific method, but in reality, the act of doing research and going in the literature, peer-reviewed research, is considered a part of the method nowadays. And the key there is peer-reviewed uh, research. So when people say, like, oh, did you do your research? Like, yeah, I, I Googled it. So that's not really research, is it? 
I know it's a big thing with social media nowadays. People saying, you know, did you do your research? And they didn't do it themselves because they just looked at Google. All right, so a hypothesis here, once again here, is an attempt to explain observations, and it must be falsifiable. So this is a statement that is not really a statement of fact. We can prove this to be false. All right, and then an experiment is basically a systematic way to get highly controlled observations. So the whole goal of an experiment is to get observations on whatever phenomenon without any other variables kind of clouding your view. So if you have to do, usually people will add a control to it where you have like one thing that's staying the same and then only the small variable changing in the actual experiment group. Um, we're not gonna do really much with the controls in this class, but keep in mind they are actually a big part of science in general. All right, so chemistry, the study of properties and materials. Basically, I like to think of it as chemistry as the study of matter, energy, and change. So we're pretty much studying everything in this class, right? I can't think of anything that is physical that doesn't fall into one of those categories. So some people have called chemistry the study of everything. It have also been called the central science. You guys heard that term before, central science? Uh, basically, that's not a way of chemists being conceited about, oh, we're the best science ever. It has to do with basically you can't do any science without doing a little bit of chemistry. At least any of the physical or biological sciences. It's not possible to, without a little bit of chemistry in there somewhere. Um, here you may notice that there's a picture of all these different chemicals here. Um, even chemists use the words chemicals like the layman's do because you have to know chemicals. People usually think things like Clorox bleach, Drano, things that are toxic. And technically that's not correct. Technically chemicals are anything physical. But even in chemistry class, we're still going to use the words chemicals for things that are, that are toxic. So it's fine if you still use that terminology. So in general, what I'm saying here is that the word chemical and the word matter can be used interchangeably if you're going by definitions. I also want to mention, guys, if you ever have any questions at any point or you want me to go back a second to clarify something, you're always more than welcome to stop me at any time. All right, uh, the three different states of matter. I kind of like this picture that's in the corner there because you know it shows all the three different states of, of water in one picture. So essentially, uh, a solid is something that does not assume the shape of a container, and the atoms or and or molecules are all tightly packed together. Um, liquids are not as quite as tightly packed, and because of that, they're able to flow a little bit more freely and they will assume the shape of whatever container they're in. Um, similarly, gases do the same thing. The biggest difference with gases is that they are floating in the air, basically. So you can think of uh, the gases as being a uh, less dense version of water, basically. All right. I told you it was gonna be quick in this chapter. All right, um, classifications of matter, you guys may recall from last semester, we had different ways to classify um, matter. We have the elements, and then we have atoms and molecules. So here we're elemental. Do you guys remember which elements are diatomic in nature? What chance? I got a fair table for you guys too, by the way. <laughs> So there's actually a, a way to remember it. So the ones that are diatomic is H, and then the, these all make the seven, all the other ones. The way I learned it when I was an undergrad was Humplebrift. But you can just say it out, that's Humplebrift. So general way, so it's once again hydrogen, nitrogen, and then the halogens. So uh, you want to be careful of that because I noticed a lot of the questions will put things in words rather than actually writing the chemical symbols out. And especially in the early chapters, we really try to get you with remembering your diatomic elements. Um, yep, absolutely. Please let me add. I'll come back to the bottom. Yeah, I'll come back to the bottom. You need three more? I do want to mention that um, I do not allow these periodic tables during the test because they have way too much information on them. They have literal, literal answer keys for some of the chapters. You guys use them? 
If we hang on to these, uh, there'll be time to write, I'll break it out and start writing on it a little bit. All right, so once again here, the atoms are the fundamental building block of matter, and the molecules are basically formations of atoms coming together. If you're referring to an element, you can have atoms or molecules, so remember which one they are diatomics. Uh, compounds are atoms of two or more elements uh, held together, and specifically, we're going to refer to them as ones that are different types of atoms. So all of these compounds here are an example of what I want to say as a compound because they have more than one element type. If they are two atoms bonded together, we're going to go ahead and call it an element. And that's the terminology I want to start using with you guys. And these are all your space filling models, a little bit of preview of some OCHEM you guys are take eventually. All right, so uh, compounds have different properties in the elements they are made from. Um, part of the things we're going to explore with these next, you know, these first two years that you guys are going to go through is sometimes which elements are involved can tell us things about physical and chemical properties. All right. So mixtures uh, versus a pure substance. Uh, a mixture is something that has a uh, variable composition, meaning that you have essentially more than one thing in there. So the example given here is coffee can be either weak or strong, or you can have things like sugar water, basically anything that is not a pure element, I would classify as a mixture. And then a pure substance is something that has the same composition, it's basically a pure compound. So pure water, for example, always has the composition of H2O. Um, keep in mind that actual water is typically not pure. The stuff that we're drinking usually has salt in it a little bit. And it's actually pretty difficult to get 100% pure water. Uh, speaking of pure water, uh, do you think it is good or bad to drink 100% pure water? It's bad for you, isn't it? What's bad about it? Do you guys know like what it does to you? So uh, it actually strips out your electrolytes from your blood. So it'll actually make you more thirsty. And the reason why is because you have a more concentrated system in your body, and then you have pure water coming in, the, the ions are going to have a tendency to go towards the water you just drank, rather than re replenishing electrolytes. So the main thing about drinking water is replenishing your electrolytes. And you're actually taking those away by drinking uh, distilled water. Uh, they, I don't think they even carry distilled water in the grocery stores anymore. They used to actually have them like at Albertsons and whatnot, and they're mostly for automotive use. But I believe they took them out because people were thinking, oh, it's pure water, it's good for you. And they're actually making themselves more thirsty and getting sick over it. <laughs> say what? They still sell Walmart. Do they? They, they probably say, well, did they say do not drink on them at least? No, that happened to me and I didn't even realize. Yeah. How did it feel? Did it make you feel more thirsty? Yeah. I, I had a headache all the time. And then I, my sister's like, that's just still water. Because my mom used the clean. I was like, oh, I mean, it doesn't taste very good either. I know, cause we, we, have the, we have the deionized water here, and I, I filled up a water bottle with it once, and oh my god, it was awful. I was like, ugh, I'll, I'd rather drink tap water than DI water. <laughs> All right, um, elements and compounds are pure substances, so when we say mixture, we're specifically referring to more than one type of compound. Vari variable composition is the key word here. And then we have the two different types of mixtures. One is homogeneous, and the other one is heterogeneous. So homogeneous is something that has the same mixture throughout, or same consistency. So uh, the main example I can think of here is like salt water or sugar water. So if you, if you add salt to some water, it's going to become all homogeneous. It's all going to mix together, right? And then eventually there becomes a point where it no longer dissolves. That's when it's heterogeneous. So the kind of thing you're going to be expected to do here is if you're given a mixture, you want to identify which type it is. So if you have something like uh, coffee, that's not a good example, um, chocolate milk, is that homogeneous or heterogeneous? Probably homogeneous. Or uh, things like raisin bran, that's usually a common one I see on these tests, that's heterogeneous. Or uh, orange juice with pulp in it. 
What is that? Heterogeneous. Okay. All right. So here is the little flow chart that you could you could follow to uh, identify whether it is a pure substance or basically which kind of mixture it is. Sorry. So is it uniform throughout? If it's not, it is heterogeneous. If it is, it's homogeneous. And then after you see it's homogeneous, you could then uh, identify if it's a pure substance or not by if it has a variable composition. And I usually like to go with, okay, if it's, if it's only one thing, it's a pure substance. If it's more than one thing, it's a homogeneous mixture. And then lastly, the last category here we should talk about is a pure substance could be broken apart into being an element or a compound. And here we have a little illustration of each of the different types. So how would you label the first one? It's elemental and it's atomic, right? And the second one, what do you guys think? Is it's elemental, and the reason why I say it's elemental is because there's only one color in there. And is it molecular or atomic? Molecular, or we can say the word is diatomic, right? So those are diatomics. And then what about the third one? Well, how would you classify that one, do you think? Compound. Compound. And I would also say pure substance as well, because I'm only seeing one component in there. Where the next one is your mixture. And unless you get a little bit more detailed than that, we can't tell from that picture if it's homogeneous or heterogeneous. But we just know it's a mixture. All right. Elements, a substance that cannot be broken down into simpler substances. Uh, we do know now that you actually can break apart atoms. Uh, the word atom itself actually came from the old Greek word atomos, uh, meaning indivisible. And basically, in terms of your standard chemistry, we can't break down an element any further than that. But if you guys go further into radiochemistry, you'll see this also next semester in 122, when you do a little bit of the nuclear stuff, that we technically can break apart uh, atoms. But that's not what you're going to be doing in this lab over here. <laughs> All right, uh, you guys are going to be expected to learn various different little aspects of the periodic table. Um, certain things like uh, which elements are liquid at room temperature, I'm not going to test you guys on that. But there actually is a way to tell uh, on the chart that I gave you guys. It's all color coded. So uh, the, the, the blue ones on the, on the table are your liquids. So it's bromine and mercury. Most of them are solids at room temperature. All the black ones. And you guys know what the transparent ones are? By chance? What's that? Well, the red, the red ones are the gases, but we, we have like the transparent ones at the bottom of the table. Those are all the synthetically man-made ones, yep. And it looks like my table is not current. Uh, the bottom row has since been named. These are placeholder names on there, but that one's not current either. But this last row has been updated within the last year, or two years now, I think. All right. And then here I mentioned your diatomics. So however you need to memorize these, please do so. There are a few tricks that I mentioned earlier on how to memorize them. Uh, here's a little table from your book that has like, you know, all the different, uh, these are the main elements we're going to work with. Um, we are going to work with more than these, but these are the main ones that we're going to be working with. Um, I would uh, start memorizing at least, at least these ones at the minimum, these, the symbols. It'll make your life a lot easier. All right, one of these is the, uh, the law of constant composition. It's a pretty important feature in chemistry. And the short version of it, what this allows us to do, it allows us to write things like chemical formulas. Because if things did not have constant compositions, writing something like H2O wouldn't make sense. So for example here, it's saying that it's 11, water is 11% hydrogen, 89% oxygen. If that was not always true 100% of the time, writing H2O would not make sense. We'd have, we'd have a variable thing here and we wouldn't be able to write chemical formulas if this law was not true.
All right, we have some properties of matter. Uh, the two main types that we're going to have to worry ourselves with are physical or chemical changes or properties here. So a physical property is something that you can observe without changing the substance. So things like the color, the melting point. Uh, what do you guys think the smell would land at? Would that be a physical or a chemical property? The smell of something. That is a physical property. The act of smelling does not change what it is. Or what if you're uh, tearing apart a sheet of paper? What do you guys think? Is that a physical or a chemical change? It's physical because after you rip the paper apart, it's still paper. Uh, what about melting a block of ice? That's a physical change because the block of ice, you know, is solid water, is now liquid water, it's still water. What about burning butane? That is a chemical change because you're your butane is no longer butane after the burning process. It's now become CO2 and water, right? So if you change whatever the, the chemical composition is, it's technically a chemical property. Um, what about eating and digestion? This is the fun one. Is that chemical or physical? Chemical. You could argue both, right? So it's actually, or what about in your mouth is the chemical or physical? Anybody who's taking anatomy and physiology know which one it is? It's actually both. Yeah. Uh, your digestion starts in your mouth. So you have chemical and you have enzymes in your mouth that are already digesting, but the act of chewing it is the physical part. So I wouldn't put something ambiguous like that on a test. It's going to be really straightforward. <laughs> but that, so, some of these changes, though, that we're going to see like, out throughout our lives are kind of ambiguous and they tend to fall into both categories. But when I ask you something in this class, it's going to be really straightforward to the point. It's going to be clearly one or the other. All right, and this is a similar example I'm saying here. So I believe they're mixing hydrogen and oxygen gas here to generate water. All right. So uh, here are some, some more examples. So first example here is a copper pan becoming blue-green. Is that chemical or physical? It's chemical. Do you guys know the Statue of Liberty is made out of copper? That's what, and it's green because of the oxidation. Uh, drain cleaner dissolves a hair clog. It's chemicals. So you may notice, like, uh, sometimes these, the wording on here is usually, usually pretty clear whether or not it's a chemical or physical change. So essentially what you want to think about in these kinds of examples is that the, if there's evidence of a chemical reaction. So this next one here is saying that it's fizzing. So you guys think. Physical or chemical? It is a chemical change. Uh, a funny thing about hydrogen peroxide is if you have, uh, I believe if you go to like Walgreens, you can buy like 10% of peroxide and you can throw in raw meat and it'll actually cook the meat. It's kind of cool. <laughs> but it'll make the whole thing foam over and fizz. All right, uh, acids produced by bacteria and plaque cause teeth to decay. That is a chemical change. And what this one? Marble statues deteriorate with acid rain. Chemical. Next one. Uh, juice fermenting when yeast is added. That is chemical as well. And what about this one? Mothballs vaporize in a cedar chest. That is a physical change. So it's basically it's going from being a solid to being a gas. And that is a physical change. It is still. Uh, that to the list, naphthalene, that's used in one of the compounds in there. It's still naphthalene after it vaporizes. And this one here, alcohol feels cool to the, as it evaporates from your skin. That is a physical change. Yep. All right. Here we go to what, 150, right? Yeah. So uh, one extra feature here, I, I know I mentioned it in my 103, but uh, we didn't technically mention it in the book are whether it's intensive or extensive. So if it's an intensive property, it does not depend on the amount that you have. And then the extensive property does depend on the quantity. So what about something like density? What do you guys think? That, what's that? It's intensive. 
So for example, if so we know how to calculate density, what was that? It was mass over volume. And as your mass increases, the volume is going to increase proportionally to it. So it doesn't really matter how much you have. It's only intensive. Um, extensive things are typically things that we measure, to be honest. So things like mass, volume, uh, temperature is not, does not depend on the amount. So once again, intensive does not depend on the amount you have. Extensive does. And we can take advantage of differences in physical properties, uh, physical and chemical properties, to uh, separate compounds. Uh, you guys are going to be doing the first one a lot in this class, uh, in lab. It's filtration. Uh, basically, you have something uh, liquid and solid that are, would it be homogeneous or heterogeneous, do you think? It's heterogeneous, yeah. Um, we'll, act, we'll actually be doing some stuff in OCHEM where we'll change mixtures from being homogeneous and heterogeneous depending on what we want to pass with the paper or not. So we can actually play tricks in the lab with filtration by changing the state that they're in. Uh, the next two methods are going to be used a lot in organic chemistry. I believe distillation is lab number four in that class. Uh, this is where you heat up a mixture of liquids and the more volatile liquid comes out first. So basically the one with the lower melting point. So you guys have probably heard about things like moonshining, people making their own alcohol. Do you guys know what the dangers are of making your own alcohol? Just don't, random trivia for you guys. You go, you heard you can go blind, right, from bad moonshining. Uh, Do anyone know the reason why you, you go blind from drinking bad alcohol from made from moonshine? It's actually the presence of methanol. So it turns out that ethanol and methanol actually have really close boiling points. So if you're not super careful, you're going to get both ethanol and methanol coming over, and that actually can cause blindness if you drink too much of it. And I do want to mention also that the, la the ethanol that you find in the labs is purposely uh, denatured, meaning they added methanol to it, meaning it's no longer safe for human consumption. So don't be like, oh, we got that liter of alcohol, let's take it. I wouldn't drink it. You're going to be blind by the next morning. <laughs> Not a good idea. Um, the last method here that I've mentioned that I want you guys to be aware of is chromatography. Um, this actually literally comes from the word of color writing, and it was typically used in the past for separation of pigments. And that's where, uh, basically if you take plant pigment, we actually have a lab in OCHEM 2 where we'll grind up spinach and run chromatography on it, you'll see all the different pigments that are in spinach. There's like 18 different pigments in spinach. That's pretty cool. Um, this is actually one of the most commonly used uh, techniques in lab, which is interesting. We don't even cover it in the semester, except for just letting you know what it is. But if you get anything done, like, uh, like uh, blood work, uh, it's typically used chromatography, uh, drug testing, uh, forensics, it has a ton of applications to it. And honestly, you know, we have all those quest diagnostics around town. They all have a chromatography machine in them. Every single one of them does. It's so commonly used. And we actually go over four different forms of it in organic, like throughout the year of organic chemistry, we cover four different methods on chromatography. All right, moving along here, uh, measurements. Uh, each uh, measurement has two parts. It's a number and a unit. And I want to put an emphasis here on the number and unit here. So anytime you guys write numbers in this class, I want you to attach a unit to it if it has one associated with it. So don't get in the habit of just writing out blank numbers and thinking units don't matter because units do matter. Uh, basically, numbers are meaningless without any context. So for example, if I said that over this weekend I walked five, that doesn't tell you anything, doesn't tell you how far I walked. It could have been five feet, five kilometers, five miles, five yards, whatever it was. So. Make sure you include your units. And the units we're going to be using primarily in this class are the, the metric system, or the SI system for short. I believe it's from this word here, that, that French, System International D Units, or just SI for short. And these are the main uh, base units that we use uh, in metric. So we have our mass, the base unit is the kilogram, length is the meter, and so on. The only one that really matches the English system is the time unit per second. It's, it's the same whether you're in metric or in the English system. 
And some of the other ones we're not going to use at all in this class, like the last two, we're not going to use at all in this class, the Ampere or the Candela. But we will be using all the other ones, like the mole, right? All right, so uh, this is a list of all the different uh, metric prefixes that you should become familiar with. And I want you guys to memorize some of them. I think you should remember between kilo and nano. So if you guys uh, will learn kilo to nano, that would be good. And there's one on there that, that I do want you guys to know. It's the angstrom. Does anybody know how big the angstrom is compared to meters? Like how many, uh, how many angstroms are in one meter? A lot. <laughs> it's actually 10 to the minus 10 angstrom. It's an A with a funny circle on top. <clears throat> actually, sorry, 10 to the plus 10 is one meter. So it's pretty, pretty small. And the reason why I want you guys to be familiar with, familiar with the angstrom is typically, that's how we talk about bond lengths is, is in that unit, is angstrom. So I'll give you an idea of how the scale that you're looking at there. So that's what four giga? Say what? That's what four giga angstrom? Um, it's actually at the bottom. So the way this table works is that is uh, the equivalent in meters. So another, another way to write this would be 10 to the minus 10 meter is one angstrom. And they're showing it this way on the table. <clears throat> All right, continuing along here, some more definitions for you guys. I think the most important definition on this table that, you, that I would remember is this one right here for volume. So one centimeter cubed is equal to one milliliter. Uh, that's going to be used as a conversion factor. Uh, typically, it's used from going between like uh, typically when density is involved. Uh, when we use that pretty often, and we'll, we'll probably do some examples. I think next time we'll do some examples, calculations on unit conversions, and we'll see that that is useful at some points. All right, uh, next thing here, we have uh, accuracy and precision. Uh, you guys will be uh, accounting for both of these aspects of your measurements in lab this semester. So we ask things like, uh, how, is it correct? And how many numbers should I write down? And then we also have the issue of uh, how close the measurement is to whatever the true value is. And accuracy and precision uh, play into this. Basically what precision is, is how you can reproduce or how reproducible your measurement was. So essentially in lab, you're going to be doing measurements a couple times and the closer they are, the better they are. And how close these are depend on two things that I've noticed. One is the user. And I say that's the number one factor there is the person doing the measuring. The second factor is the equipment. So if you guys say that I had bad precision because my instruments were bad, it's probably because you were bad. <laughs> but your teacher probably won't say that out loud. But that's what I'm, sure, I'm sure it's what they'll think. <laughs> but both those factors come into play. So essentially what accuracy is, so we, hear, we have an analogy here showing all the different things here. Uh, accuracy is how close you are to the true value. So I do want to mention, I'll write it up on the board here. So the way we account for accuracy is a percent error calculation. So we use percent error. And then precision, does anybody know how we measure precision? This is how close repeated measurements are. Difference. I'm looking for a key word here. It's that standard deviation typically. So you guys are going to be doing percent average deviation, but in general it's just deviation. There's a couple different versions of this, and I'm pretty sure that you guys in lab will be doing percent average deviation, and your teacher will be showing you these things. 
But once again, going back here to this analogy, something that is uh, the one that's highly accurate, highly precise, assuming the bullseye is your true value, would be the first one here where you get all the values are close to it and they're all kind of close together. Uh, the next one here, will be, how do you guys classify the second one? I would, go ahead. It's precise but not accurate. Yes, exactly. So it, that is precise but not accurate. So precision meaning that the points are all close together. It's not accurate because it's really far off from the bullseye. And then the last one here, what do you guys think? It's not accurate or precise, right? Because it's kind of all over the place. And hopefully you guys are not getting this kind of data in lab. And if you're, if, you're, if you're really good at chemistry and you had a lot, of, a lot of practice, you'd probably get a lot of the first one here. All right, another thing too is uh, how are we going to read digits here? So if you're using something that has a digital readout, you literally just write down what, whatever the readout says. But in the case of using a ruler, like this week in lab, you're going to be using rulers and graduated cylinders and that kind of thing. You have to understand how to read the values. So basically what we do here is uh, we say the certainty values. So uh, what values on here do we know for certain? So this looks like it's breaking it down every 0.2, right? Th this, this ruler here. Basically what I'm asking here is how would you record this number? So we're trying to measure this distance right here. My mouse is showing up. So the, the end of that tip there, how would you report that value? 2.5. 2.5, exactly. So I'm thinking those notches look like they're going every 0.2, because there's five notches in their total, so 0.2s. So we know for certain it's at least uh, 2.4 at the minimum. This last digit is your estimation. So if you're thinking that lands exactly in the middle, I would actually report it as 2.50. Uh, the main takeaway here is that you always include one extra digit that you're estimating. So if you're thinking it's landing exactly on a line, you give an extra zero digit to it. Or if you think it's like roughly in the middle, give it an extra five at the end. But basically you're giving it one more digit. The way this works out in a digital readout is that like on a scale, for example, that last digit kind of fluctuates that last digit is the uncertainty value. But now I have a question is which ones are significant? So out of this measurement here, we have to measure this to be 2.50 centimeters. So we have two certain values, one uncertain value. Which ones are significant? Is it just the certain values? No, so when you're looking at significant figures, everything is significant. Yeah. The, uh, the certainty and the uncertainty is significant. Uh, basically, the reason why we, we put emphasis on that in chemistry is because it tells the reader how accurate your measurements were, or the accurate or precise your measurements were. Which one is it? It's how accurate your measurements are, right? All right. So as I just mentioned here, this does tell us the number of sig figs. So in short, if you have a digital readout, like the ones in the lab, just take all, all, take all the digits. If you're measuring something manually, give it one extra digit. Okay, so when talking about uh, significant figures, and we also have this factor of exact numbers, um, you want to be careful of these, especially in calculations. I think exact numbers are the biggest error students make, in my, my experience, when they're doing calculations with thick figs. So in general, uh, exact numbers are a count of discrete objects and numbers that are part of an equation and definitions. So for example, if I say that I'm holding two markers, this is an exact number. It does not make sense to say 2.0 markers because I have exactly two in my hand. Uh, same thing here with a 13 pencils example. Another example here is uh, unit definition. So any unit conversion, basically any table information, anything you got from a table, whether it's a conversion factor, a mass of the periodic table, a table in your book, whatever, that is all exact numbers. They do not limit your sig figs. 
And then the last one I mentioned there was the uh, number that are part of an equation. We don't encounter that too much in this class, but it is a thing. So like for like the area of a triangle is what? Area is equal to one half base times height. That one half term is an exact number. It does not have a number of sig figs, but it has an infinite number of sig figs. All right, so going over some sig fig rules again. I'm hoping you guys remember this stuff from last semester. So in general, uh, non-zeros are significant, are always significant. And basically, these sig fig rules only really apply, at least for determining sig figs, if you're reading the numbers. If you're actually measuring it yourself, you're the one determining how many sig figs there are by your measurement. These are from when you're like reading numbers off a table or something, or out of your textbook. Uh, zero, zeros are the tricky part with sig figs. So anything with a, a leading zero, meaning it's before it, are those significant? Nope, they are basically placeholders, right? They just, they're holding your place there. They are not significant. And then we have the captive zeros. You basically want to treat those as if they're non-zeros, so they are significant. And then trailing zeros are significant as long as they're after a decimal. So for example, the way we write 100 versus 100 with a decimal, your sig figs are changing there, right? So the first one has only one sig fig, the second way has two sig figs, the way you write it. All right, um, now we have our uh, significant figures rules. Uh, the rule for addition and subtraction is that your answer will have as many decimal places as the least, uh, the least accurate value. So the way you can, you can start doing additions when you're first practicing your sig fig rules is to go ahead and kind of line them all up by the decimal. And then your answer is going to have as many decimal places as the one with the least. So the first value is going to be the limiting factor here that we only have one decimal place where the other ones have two and three respectively. You carry out the operation like normal and then we have to do some rounding at the end. Hopefully you guys remember your rounding abilities. So basically you look at the last digit that was dropped, sorry, the first digit that's dropped, and then if it's greater than or equal to five, you round up. Less than five, you round down. I do want to point out that in, when you're doing uh, operations with addition and subtraction, it is possible to gain or lose sig figs depending on if you're changing changing in order of magnitude. So if you're going up in order of magnitude by an addition, you will actually gain a sig fig that way. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because uh, this is often the case when we're working with temperature conversions. So you really, really want to be careful with the addition rules here that you're not dropping off sig figs unnecessarily. All right, and then the next rule set here is for multiplication and division. So basically, the way multiplication and division works is your answer will have uh, as many sig figs as your, the one with the least. So this example here, we have three significant figures in the first number, four sig figs in the second number. So how many sig figs should be in our answer? Should be three, whichever one had the least. So we look at both digits involved, three sig figs, four sig figs. And then you carry out the operation like normal. And then your final answer is rounded to three sig figs. One thing you also want to be careful about here, uh, suppose the first number was like some kind of conversion factor. How many sig figs would your answer have? What's that? Well, so, so, well so once again, your, the first number there, that 22.3, let's just uh, pretend that that is a conversion factor. So your limiting factor is going to be the other one, right? It's going to have four sig figs. So be careful. That's a really common thing I'll, I'll see. Like, for example, the conversion from inches to centimeter is 2.54 centimeter. If your number you're coming in with has four sig figs, your answer is still going to have four sig figs because that 2.54 conversion factor is an exact number. So just be careful of that. When you're, if your conversion factor has less sig figs or appears to have less sig figs than your actual number, it's trying to trick you there. 
So exact, try to identify exact numbers as being like conversion factors and we ignore them. All right, and then uh, when you're combining uh, significant figures rules or uh, multi-step multi operations, you basically apply each sig fig rule as you go along following the proper order of, of operations. And what was that uh, acronym for remembering that? Was that PEMDAS? P-E-M-D-A-S? So I'm hoping you guys still remember that. Uh, let me get a sheet of paper here. And I wanted to work through this calculation. Test out my document camera. Let me switch this out. All right, so we're going to switch this to webcam document. I will adjust the size of it too, don't worry. All right, play out projector screen one. And I want this to be. Yay, it worked. <laughs> Uh-oh. So I'm having an issue with this thing where it'll randomly disconnect like a second and then come back. And it keeps doing that. So if anybody knows about webcams and all that stuff, help, feel free to help me out. <laughs> I have to learn this stuff. But... All right, so what was that number again? So I want to go ahead and work through this here. So it's 29.2 minus 20.2 divided by 3. And there were some parentheses there. So let me switch over to the dot cam again. All right, and then. All right, so what do I do first? What, what's in parentheses, right? So basically what you want to do is follow the order of operations and I, you want to keep like a little tally of your sig fig rules as you go along. So 29.2 minus 20.2 is what? What's that? Oops. 9.0. So uh, how many six figs are in that number right now? Uh, so what rule should I be applying here? Addition and subtraction goes by the number of decimal places. So they both have one decimal place. We're good. Two six figs. So two SF. And then the next calculation is 3.00. That's going to be equal to three. But how many six figs should my final answer have? Two. Yep. Um, the biggest place I've seen where this becomes really tricky is temperature conversion. That's the main place because you have a multiplication, then you have an addition or subtraction. And we'll, we'll see that definitely later on, but that's usually the most place where people will try to trick you with the sig fig rules here. All right. Desktop. Okay, uh, next thing we have here is uh, scientific notation. And actually, I think that's actually a good place to stop. We'll, just go, ahead, we'll go ahead and pick up with this next time. Um, if you guys have any questions about anything, feel free to ask. Did you have a question, sir? Let me, or the guy behind you. Yeah. The PowerPoints are in the modules in Canvas. So it's like the, it's in there under under reference materials. Are there any other questions? All right.